Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Michaela, for that very kind introduction. And thank you all so much for coming tonight. I'm really excited to speak with you. Um, as Michaela mentioned, I was lucky enough to receive a conservation grant from the Sequoia Park Zoo in 2017. So I'm here today to talk to you about how I use that money and um, to do my research for my project at Humboldt State. So just a little brief overview of what we're talking about today. I'm going to start with a little bit of background, just to let you know some information about fishers and squirrels and how that uh, relates to acorns. And then you, from that, we'll talk about the questions that I developed and the methods that I used to answer those questions in my research. And then from there, we'll talk about the results of my research and what those results mean. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about management implications of those results. So how can conservationist managers on the landscape use the results of my study to conserve fishers? So you might not know, but fishers are the coolest animal around. It's just my opinion. 
They are a mid-sized member of the weasel family, so they're closely related to marten, minks, otters, uh, wolverine. And just like all members of this family, um, fishers are carnivore. And fishers are solitary um, throughout their life, except for females with uh, young. So for about four months of the year, females will care for their young, but for the remainder of the year, females are solitary. And males are solitary all year, except for while they're breeding. And fishers are a forest-dwelling carnivore. So they're found in mid-elevation forests uh, that usually comprised of mixed conifer species, as well as some hardwood components. So oaks, alders, maples, that sort of thing. This map shows uh, the range of fishers in North America. They're actually endemic to North America. They're only found here, one of the things I love about them. And this lighter shaded region here shows the fishers range in North America prior to European settlement. And so this darker range here is where fishers currently exist. And you can see it's um, been reduced greatly. They're now only inhabiting about 68% of their historical range. We zoom in a little bit more into where we are, our part of the world here on the west coast, you get a really good look at how that contraction has occurred. This light gray part, again, po is pre-European settlement, and these darker regions represent current populations. And if we look in California, we see there's two disjunct populations that are still existing. Um, this northern California population and then down here in the southern Sierra. And here, in this region, is where the reintroduction occurred that Michaela mentioned. And there's actually been a lot of reintroduction efforts across North America. All of these icons that you see, these circles, squares, and diamonds, all represent a different reintroduction effort that has occurred for fishers. And so again, we see here is that circle of the Northern Sierra Nevada population. You guys might have heard about some of the more recent introductions in Washington. And all throughout this um, area, wherever fishers occur, um, they're found in mature forests mostly. They like big trees. They like a closed canopy, and they also like a diverse understory. So um, that means a mixture of different species as well as a structurally diverse understory where you can picture from the ground to the top of the trees different layers of tree species of differing ages. They also like woody debris, so fallen logs, as well as standing dead trees such as snags. And that's because these uh, woody debris are create the structure that fishers need for a large part of their life cycle. They use cavities to give birth to their young as well as to raise their young. Um, they also use cavities and large branches and crevices for resting throughout their life. So um, that's why these woody debris items and cavities, standing trees are really important for fishers. Here um, are just two photos of the two maternal fisher dens that I got in the field. So maternal means this is where they gave birth. Um, on the left here, it was a black oak den, and you can see um, kind of this different layers of the, the understory. There's some downed wood here. Um, there's several different cavities in this tree. There's cavities in this tree next to it as well. This over here is a, uh, an incense cedar snag, and you might be able to see the cavities up at the top here where she had her kits. And again, you can see there's a mixture of hardwoods, there's several different conifer species, all creating a, a multi-layered and diverse understory. And so you might be wondering, what do fishers eat? Um, in most of their range outside of California, fishers are actually specialized to hunt and kill porcupines. They're one of the few animals that do that. They also love a good snowshoe hare. Um, but things are a little bit different here in California. Um, porcupines are mostly rare or absent in mid-elevation forests here in California. And this is due to a history of lethal removal. Porcupines damage timber products, so timber companies have in the past actively removed them from the landscape to protect their timber products. So those populations are still rebounding from that, and so fishers aren't really coming across porcupines where they live here in California. The same is true uh, for snowshoe hares. Fishers don't really inhabit the same habitat types as snowshoe hares. Snowshoe hares are found at higher elevations in the Sierra Nevada and are found in different vegetative communities as well. So again, fishers aren't really running into these two critters out in the woods here in California. Um, they're more of a generalist predator here. So they're gonna eat a more diverse range of items from different groups such as birds, insects, um, even plant material in some cases. 
Um, but they still like to try and go for the biggest bang for their buck. They'll try and get the biggest prey item they can find. So in the absence of porcupine and snowshoe hare, that leaves um, a lot of small mammals, such as rodents, right? And there's been some recent work um, in the southern Sierras as well in my study area and recently in southern Oregon to take a closer look at what items fishers are, are preying on. And so when you collect scat, so here's some fisher scat that's being washed in a lab at North Carolina State University, you have to rinse the scat really well to get the items that are there for classification. And here we see some squirrel claws, and on the right we see squirrel molars. And that's because we found in these scat analyses that fishers really like to eat squirrels. Specifically, here in California, we're finding they really like Douglas squirrels and western gray squirrels. And this is likely because in the absence of animals like porcupines and snowshoe hares, this is the largest bodied prey item available to them in the landscape. And they were um, two of the most commonly identified prey items in these scat studies that were done. Particularly western gray are, uh, were the number one prey item that was identified. So it seems like these are probably important for fishers. And if they are important, they might be influencing where fishers choose to go on the landscape. And so when we as biologists are thinking, what can we do to protect fishers? How can we conserve this species? Um, you might want to think about where squirrels going, because maybe that's where fishers are going to. And that is where acorns and masting hardwoods come in. So hardwoods that produce acorns or masting hardwoods are important for squirrels because acorns are a primary component of squirrels' diet. Especially the western gray squirrel, they will utilize acorns throughout the year. Um, western Douglas squirrels more so in the summer and fall to build fat stores for winter, but both of these squirrels rely on acorns in their diet. Um, squirrels also eat a lot of things like fungus, berries, and other plant material, but these fatty acorns are an important component. And in the northern Sierra Nevada, two common hardwoods that you'll find that produce acorns are black oak and tan oak. And these two species differ in their capacity to produce acorns. And this table here is just breaking that down for us. So on the top we have black oak, and a black oak will start to produce acorns dependably at about 80 years of age. In comparison, a tan oak can start to do that as young as 40 years of age. And when these trees are on the, in these age classes, they're, they're pretty close in size. Um, tan oaks are a bit smaller, but this is the big takeaway here. The average tan oak can produce almost twice as many acorns per tree than a black oak twice as age and slightly larger. So tan oaks have the ability to potentially provide a lot of good quality fat resource for squirrels. So these trees might be extremely important for squirrels and might dictate where squirrels are going. <clears throat> so again, that reintroduction effort here in the Northern Sierra Nevada started in 2009 and it took about two years to fully release 40 adult fishers from this part of California down here. And currently there's about 70 individuals known alive in the population. And so it's, it's a successful reintroduction by all accounts. And um, this is a really great area to kind of look at this question of, um, of tan oak and black oak because there's a lot of that occurring here in this part of the, the Sierra Nevada. It's a beautiful area if you haven't been there. It's about 30 miles uh, northeast of Chico, California in Butte and Tehama counties. Um, it's mid to low elevation, so about 1,500 to 6,000 feet. And the area where I was working and where the fishers were reintroduced was on a large tract of land owned and operated by Sierra Pacific Industries. So these fishers are living on an actively logged landscape and so this is a really great opportunity to understand how heavily managed landscapes can support fisher populations, and it opened the door to a lot of interesting research. There we go. I was really lucky when I graduated college in 2013 to score a job on this translocation. I was very excited. Um, I got to trap fishers every year, work very closely with them, and then I got to go out every day and find them in the woods and we put radio collars on them. So it was my job to go and figure out where they were, um, sometimes walk in and find their den locations. Um, but it was a really great project and it allowed us to um, research fishers more closely, see what their behaviors were, where they are going on the landscape, and also keep track of the population as a whole. And while I was working out there, this is the kind of forest that I was expecting to always find fishers in. If you think of an old growth forest, big trees, big logs, 
closed canopy, I always, that's what we knew as fisher habitats. So I always thought, well, that's where fishers are going to be. But I often found when I was finding fishers that they were in stands that looked a lot more like this. Um, skinnier trees, more open canopies, a lot of hardwoods. This is a tan oak stand. This is a tan oak stand here. The down wood is less big. It's more like you know branches than logs. Things that you wouldn't think were good fisher habitat. So it kind of got me wondering, why would a fisher come here? And when I was working with Michaela and my graduate committee on developing research ideas, this is something we talked about. And we thought, well, maybe they're going here to forage. Because maybe the structures that they use for denning and resting aren't the only thing they need, right? Maybe there's other things in the landscape providing good resources for their prey. And if that's the case, um, then we should maybe try and look at that a little closer. Are there more squirrels there? And if so, are fishers going there to find squirrels? And so that brings us to the questions that I pose for my research and the methods that I use to answer them. So I asked two major questions. The first of which, um, do forest stands with a greater capacity to produce acorns support bigger numbers of Douglas squirrel and Western gray squirrel? And if you're familiar with wildlife research, um, measuring populations requires going out, trapping animals, marking them, releasing them again, trapping them again. It's labor intensive, it's costly, and it can be harmful to the animals. Additionally, squirrels are notoriously hard to trap. Um, especially western gray squirrels, they just don't really like to go and trap. So it can be hard to get direct population size estimates on these animals. But biologists are creative. So we've found a lot of ways to get around these kinds of things in the natural world to answer questions that can be hard to get at. And non-invasive methods are one of those. So using um, track plates or remote cameras can allow us to measure different things, such as the measured levels of use of an area, as well as our ability to detect an animal. And the patterns in those numbers can reflect the population size that is occurring in that area. So we don't have to directly measure the population to kind of get an idea of what patterns are occurring on the landscape. And so using this non-invasive framework and this question, I posed a first prediction that I believe that stands with a tan oak dominant component would have the highest levels of use and probability of detection of tree squirrels. And when I say tree squirrels, that's just a collective word for Douglas squirrel and Western gray. And then my second question was related to the first question. Are fishers using stands with the potentially highest number of tree squirrels? Are they choosing stands specifically because there are more squirrels there? And again, using that non-invasive framework, I posed a second prediction that a stands with a tan oak component would have the highest levels of use and detection of fisher. So, as Michaela mentioned, I surveyed a total of 85 stands. And we did that for a period of 44 weeks over in 2017, so almost the entire year. And when we were trying to decide um, where to put the cameras, one thing we wanted to be sure of was that the stands we selected should represent what we know to be good fisher habitat. So all of the stands had relatively large trees, generally the same size between stands. And also, all of the stands had moderately high canopy closure. So we kind of controlled for that to make sure that all else being equal, what would be different for the, in terms of squirrels, if everything else is equal, what might be affecting fishers using that habitat? And ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Hold on. Don't look. Oh my, I don't know what's going on here. Pardon me. It just keeps, yeah, it just keeps skipping to the end. I don't know if the button's stuck. Sorry, everyone. All right. Okay, let's try that again. All right, where was I? So, okay, so they all had um, the, these similar forest characteristics. And then we created three stand types. So what that means is um, the first stand type was dominated by a black oak component. So all of these stands are a mixed conifer forest with a hardwood component. And the first type would have a dominance of black oak. So 20, 50% of that stand was dominated by a black oak. Um, then the next stand type, similarly, 20 to 50% of the trees in that stand were tan oak. And then we created a sort of control, 
um, set of stands that we called conifer stands. And these are dominated by conifers. They have a small hardwood component of less than 20%. So whatever hardwoods are occurring in there, it's small. Um, and that is meant to be compared to the hardwood stands, and then the two black oak stands can be, the black oak and tan oak can be compared to each other. And so after we picked our sites using some computer software, I went out there in the field, I located a suitable site as close to the center of the stand as I could to um, put, you might be able to see the camera here on this tree. And so I would put the camera on the tree and I would point it um, at another tree close by, that was my bait tree. And I did this so that the ground is visible and both sides of the tree as well as the bait. And this bait here, this is smooth peanut butter that I just smeared on the tree with a stick here. And these are in-shell walnuts that I drilled holes into and strung on a metal wire. Um, it's a lot more labor intensive than you might think. <laughs> <laughs> and this was really exciting because um, there's only been a handful of researchers that have used this kind of bait, and it's usually in conjunction with another bait, so like chicken and some sort of scent lure. Um, this is, as far as me and my committee members know, one of the few times that just peanut butter and nuts have been put out there to get wildlife. And we weren't really sure if we were going to get fishers or not, um, or how well it was going to work. It was kind of a, an experiment. And we ended up um, being really excited and surprised at the number of photos that we are getting. So this is just, the, I mean, these are just the same like collection of, this was just 10 minutes of so many photos of fisher kits and fisher moms. So this is a female. Um, you can see her collar there with her two kits. Um, they're probably about four weeks old in this photo. Um, but what's great about these cameras, you can just set them out there and then you can get series of photographs and by looking at the photos you can determine the number of visitation events that occur at the camera. You can say a fisher came to this camera this many times and a squirrel came to this camera this many times. And there's um, some really cool software out there. Reconyx is a, a remote camera manufacturer and they have this program that lets you input your photos directly into the program and it outputs a spreadsheet with associated data for each individual photo. So every line in an Excel spreadsheet becomes um, a data point and it's associated with a photo. And it has the date and the location. Um, and then with the help of about five volunteers from HSU, we went through each individual photo and added data to each line saying what we were seeing in the photo, what species was there, how many species, what they were doing. And then for my analysis, it was sort of a, a two-part analysis. So we got that data into those spreadsheets, and then I was able to do some statistical um, digging in there. And so what I was looking at was two things, use and detection. Um, I wanted to know the level of use and the probability that a stand was being used either by a squirrel or either of the, um, I'm sorry, a fisher or either of the two squirrel species that I was looking at. And then additionally, when you're using cameras, you can get um, at the rate of detection, which allows you to estimate how well you're detecting the species given that it's there. And detection helps inform use, but it also gives another level, a way to measure use. Because an animal that is repeatedly coming to a stand is likely going to be detected more frequently. And additionally, an animal that's moving around in a stand will likely also be detected more frequently. So higher detection kind of implies heavier use. And then the second part of my analysis, I wanted to look more closely at the relationship between fishers and gray squirrels. Um, gray squirrels are considerably larger than Duggar squirrels, so they're probably um, better for squirrels as far as a meal, or I'm sorry, better for fishers as far as a meal goes. They get bigger bang for their bunk, right, with a bigger animal. And also, they were the number one item we found in that fisher scat study. So we think that they're really important. And so I wanted to know, do fishers use stand conditional on a gray squirrel being there? Is a fisher going to a stand because a gray squirrel is there? Are they more likely to go to a stand when a gray squirrel is present than when it's absent? And so I used some, some confusing statistics to kind of see what, um, what was going on with that relationship there. And here are my results. This number, that's how many photos we looked at, over half a million photos. Um, it took several months. It was a lot of work, but it was also really fun. It's like Christmas every day when you get to go look at your camera photos. Um, and this table here, these numbers are independent visitation events to the cameras. And the takeaway that I want you to see is for Douglas squirrel, we saw the highest number of visitation events occur in conifer stands. But for gray squirrel and fisher, the greatest number of visitation events occurred in those tan oak stands. 
And so for that first part of my analysis that I talked about, where I was looking at use and detection, um, for Douglas squirrel, we saw that they use all the stands a lot. So there's a lot of Douglas squirrel out there. They seem to be using all of the stands relatively equally. The conifer stands, maybe just a little bit more. But detection for Douglas squirrels was the highest in conifer stands. And for gray squirrels, we saw that use level was highest in tan oak stands, and detection was also highest in tan oak stands. And the most exciting part was that use levels for Fisher were also highest in tan oak stands, and so were detection rates. So Fisher and Western Gray have a similar pattern of use and detection in those tan oak stands. And for the second part of my analysis, where I was seeing, does a gray squirrel need to be in the stand for a Fisher to be there? Well, the answer is no. <laughs> um, they, it's not conditional. Fishers are going to these stands regardless of whether a gray squirrel is there. That's at least the conclusion we came from from my data. It wasn't a super fine analysis. We can't say with definitive um, certainty that they're not doing that, but my data didn't support that they were. However, what we did see that fishers are using tan oak stands at the greatest rate regardless of whether squirrels are there. So something's going on in that tan oak. And that second part of the analysis, I looked at these different detection outcomes that could occur. So I had 44 survey weeks, and with each, within each of those weeks, these are the different outcomes that could occur. Either neither of these species were there, only the squirrel, only the fisher, or both. And what was interesting when we looked at that data was that tan oaks were the only stand where we had zero weeks where neither were present. So that means for the entire 44 weeks of my survey, either a squirrel or a fisher was always in a tan oak stand. Um, and then tan oak stands also had the greatest number of detection outcomes where both species were present. So again, even though my data didn't say with certainty that there's a conditional use going on between fishers and western gray squirrels, we do see that something's going on here, right? The level of use is the highest, the detection is the highest, and it seems like both these species really like to go to tan oak stands. So, that comes back around to those questions and the predictions that I posed. My first prediction was that the stands with the tan oak component would have that highest level of use and detection of tree squirrels. And this prediction was not supported for Douglas squirrels because we saw that they had that in the conifer stands. And, but for gray squirrels, my prediction was supported. They had the highest level of use and detection in these tan oak stands. And what does that mean for my original question? Do these stands that can provide more acorns for squirrels support greater number of western gray and Douglas squirrels? Um, it doesn't look like that's the case for western, or I'm sorry, for Douglas squirrel, right? Um, as I said, they are really focused on um, pine seeds. They're a conifer cone seed specialist. Acorns are more of a secondary component of their diet. So it looks like there's actually a greater number of squirrels in the conifer stands, which makes sense um, because that's what they like is those conifer seeds. And it makes sense that they would have been seen in all of my stands because this is a mixed conifer forest. So um, it appears that there's uh, an abundance of Douglas squirrels out there in all of these stands. And then for Western gray squirrel, um, if the, the detection and the use level that we see does reflect the population size, it appears that tan oak might support the greatest number of western gray squirrels. And again, that's because of this resource that they can find for acorns, but tan oak are also really important they, um, for mycorrhizal fun fungi, which squirrels love to eat, and other fruiting um, understory species. So there's a lot of food in tan oak stands for squirrels in general. So I think that it's a com combination of this this acorns and other diverse food resources that are available for western gray squirrels there that might be making that happen. And then my second prediction that stands with the tan oak component would have the highest levels of fisher use. And uh, this prediction was supported because we did see that the highest levels of use and detection occurred in, stan in tan oak for fisher. And that comes around to the, my big question really, do fishers use stand with the potentially greatest number of tree squirrels? So it does appear that there's potentially a bigger number of western gray squirrels in tan oak stands, but again, my data couldn't say definitively they're going there just for gray squirrels, but we, it seems like there might be more there. Um, so what I think is there's a possibility that there's a couple different things happening here. The first one might be that fishers are selecting these stands because there's gray squirrels there. They're going to tan oak stands because there's gray squirrels there because they love those acorns, right? That might be what's going on. It could also be that fishers are selecting these tan oak stands because they're generally abundant with prey. 
Acorns are great for um, all, all mammals, um, especially other rodents like rats and mice. And then again, that those um, relationships and associations with fungi and other understory plants make it a good uh, resource for lots of potential prey items for fisher. So they might be going to tan oak stands because there's lots of prey there. And then they're going to take gray squirrel when it's available to them because it's one of the largest bodied prey that's available for them to, to consume in that area. Or uh, the third possibility is that they're going to these tan oak stands for completely different reasons. They might not be foraging there. They might just be traveling through them to get to point A, from point A to point B, and taking gray squirrels opportunistically along the way. Unfortunately, in my research, we can't know for fact what the fishers are doing in those stands, but they're obviously using them a lot. So um, it's probably because, the, like I said, of the either abundant prey resources there or they're moving through the landscape for different reasons and foraging there as they're passing through. And really the reason we do wildlife re research is to inform managers, right? So I think that my research has shown that a moderate amount of acorn producing hardwoods on the landscape are important, probably for all wildlife, but especially for fishers on uh, the west coast. And I would recommend to managers that are, especially private land managers, um, if they're doing any sort of um, management plans in their land to try to retain important hardwoods like tan oak. So one way they could go about doing this would be to spray herbicide sparingly and with careful consideration. Um, when timber is harvested by timber companies, they come through shortly afterwards and spray herbicide to squelch the growth of plants that come up immediately after disturbance. And that's because they create shade, which kills young conifers. And what timber companies want are big conifers. So they come through and they kill all the plants that could potentially stunt the growth of their conifers. And so I would just say, uh, if they're doing that in an area with tan oak, to consider the consequences if they are hoping to conserve fissures. I would also recommend that they retain large mature tan oak trees whenever possible, um, because these are the trees that are really producing the acorns that are really doing the work. So if managers can keep at least some percentage of these trees when they're doing tree removal, um, I do think that that would benefit fissures in the long term. And on uh, public lands that aren't necessarily intensively managed, um, that aren't having trees being removed, um, what we probably need to think about more is the uh, impacts of drought and fire and how that might impact this relationship of tan oak squirrels and fishers. And drought is not great for tan oak. Tan oak needs moist soil to grow and for seeds to germinate. So without that, there might be mortality in seedling growth. Um, drought can also reduce acorn production in, acorn, in tan oak and can also affect fungal networks. So it will have these indirect effects on tan oaks which would maybe change the way acorn production occurs, which could affect squirrel populations and could negatively affect fisher populations. And additionally, you know, fire is a big concern in our forests here in California. And aside from direct mortality, um, if enough fire happens and enough, if severe enough fires in short enough succession, there can actually be complete replacement of tan oak on the landscape by brush. So that's another thing for managers to keep in mind if they have these disturbances on their landscape, that um, if the tan oaks are, are killed, that's a potential resource loss for these squirrels, which again could negatively affect fishers. And then finally, there we go, uh, managers are moving using long-term monitoring um, a lot more commonly. Remote cameras are becoming increasingly popular. And that's because you can just throw stuff out there and get awesome pictures like this. And you can learn a lot about what's going on out there with them. And I've shown that you can use something like peanut butter and nuts to get uh, pictures of a lot of different species. These are ringtails up here. Here's a beautiful gray fox. Um, I also got large carnivores, this deer really, everything loves peanut butter, so it's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty easy to get animals to come to peanut butter. Um, but really, the, I think the most important thing is how well we were able to detect squirrels. We got the western gray, this upside down dog squirrel here. This is a California ground squirrel. Um, you know, we overlook these things a lot, these smaller critters when we're talking about carnivores, these charismatic species that we all love and want to conserve. It really does come back to these relationships they have with their prey, with the landscape they're on. So I think that I've shown a way that we can creatively find more information about these little animals that are out in the woods and are so important to the animals that we love. 
And so with that, oh, I just want to quickly, again, thank the Sequoia Park Zoo so much for providing me with this grant. My research would not have been possible. So thank you to everyone who contributes to that. Um, also to Sierra Pacific Industries for having me on their land and allowing me to, to carry out this research. So many different agencies that uh, were a part of this work, um, as well as my graduate committee and a long list of people that I love and that supported me through my, my graduate work. And uh, with that, I will take any questions. Were you able to develop personal relationships with some of the, uh, yes. The, the fishers? Yeah. Yeah, I definitely. Mean, there were animals, here. yeah, there'd be animals you, you catch year to year that you get to hold in hand yeah. and see how they grow every year. Um, and then also certain females that you just like were always really hard to find and you'd be like, oh, I hate her, or I love her. <laughs> I really like male fishers, they're like little teddy bears and there was one in particular that I, every year when I would catch him, it would just make me, make my heart sing, I love them. And would you go from one year to the next and then when saw you, it was like, oh yeah, here she is. No, I don't think they liked me as much as I liked them. <laughs> yeah, there's the peanut butter girl. <laughs> yeah. Does Fish and Wildlife give take permits as far as pelts or anything? Not in California. So at least this, the Southern Sierra population is listed as threatened under the California Endangered Species Act. Yeah, and they're currently right now the um, being petitioned for listing under the Federally Endangered Species Act as well. Good. So are they reintroducing species like that? Do they go 50-50 male, female, or how do they proportion? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit, I think a little bit more complex than that. I, I don't remember the exact number, but there were more males to females. Males disperse much further than females, so if you're putting them out there, you're likely to probably lose a few males. They'll, they have a higher mortality rate as well to females because they move so much further. It would go the other way around. If the females have a higher mortality, you would want them. No, the males have a higher mortality oh, okay. because they roam so much further, yeah. So has there been any impact by the uh, cannabis? Um, yeah, not so much. Um, here In the Northern Sierras, it is a little bit of a problem, but um, SPI does a really good job of excluding people from their land. Um, but that's definitely a huge issue in the Southern Sierra Nevada mountains where there's a lot more public land. Um, and that is one of the major uh, reasons why they're petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act, at least the West Coast population, yeah. But that's not as big of a problem where we are. Um, they haven't, uh, they've done a, some necropsies on, on fishers and we haven't found any red, rodenticide traces yet in our, in our population. Oh, a bunch of hands just went up. I think you were first, all the way in the back there. Um, I do get a sense of your spatial relation of your cameras. Is there any chance that your fishers are going to several cameras? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I didn't really get into the nitty gritty details there. My cameras were, were autocorrelated for fishers. Um, so it wasn't independent in, uh, animals going to each camera. We spaced them about 500 meters apart minimum um, for, to prevent correlation between sites for squirrels. Good question. Yeah. Um, is 2017 considered like a heavy mass in the years of Spanos, or was it a pretty average crop? Oh, that's a great question. So I didn't directly um, measure the amount of mast. Um, unfortunately, that's uh, not something I was able to do. Um, I would say it was about an average year. Um, 2015 was like the heaviest year that I saw, but that's a really good point. Um, masting trees do vary in how much mast they produce each year. But um, tan oak is known to be one of the most dependable species, whereas black oak will maybe do it every one to three years. Tan oaks typically do produce about uh, the same amount of mast every year. And was black oak considered low or anything like that? Not that I know of, but again, um, we didn't quantify that. So there, are, there is a study, uh, Jenkins did a study on the East Coast where he did directly quantify mass, and he did find that as mass increased, Squirrels increased, and so did fishers. So there is evidence of that out there. Is there any information about reproductive capabilities between the north and the south populations of fishers? As far as reproducing yes. between each other? Yes. Right now, they're, they're geographically too isolated for that to occur. Right, so that's not. So was that, though, at one time, they were able to... At one time, yes, but there's actually, we 
for a long time thought that the separation uh, between the two populations happened because of human in you know the habitat destruction or hunting but there's actually evidence that shows that there was genetic divergence between those populations long before um, Europeans were here and we don't actually know why that that happened so that's a, a great question we don't know if there was connectivity between the populations what would happen if, if we started to get mating there so yeah They are anesthetized, so they're they're really drowsy. They're very friendly. They can't. They're just kind of woozy and coming up from drugs. Um, so no, I mean you do have to obviously you know always be on alert, but they are usually um, incapacitated. And when you have uh, this invite of peanut butter and stuff, had you any problems with animals? No, it seemed that um, and it was usually if there was multiple animals at the camera at the same time, it was a group like a, a, a mother fisher and her kits or a female gray fox with one of her kits. Um, I didn't really ever see, there was a couple instances of different species there at the same time, but um, nothing occurred that where there was any sort of, um, there was no interaction that I could see on camera anyway. What happened behind the scenes, I don't know. One more question. Yeah. So they flip them over, they flip very carefully, they flip them over on their back and they go in through the, the front where they don't have the, the quills. Yeah. Um, the, the, the tract of land that's owned by Sierra Pacific is about 650 square kilometers. It's pretty large. And I would say that my cameras ranged throughout most of that. There was a section at the top um, where I didn't have cameras, but it was a, a, a spatially wide study. That's why I had so many cameras that covered through that whole area. Yeah. So the location where the reintroduction occurred, um, I was thinking before you said what you said a minute ago that you picked that spot because it might help connect the mm -hmm. populations. It doesn't sound like that's necessarily true. Why, why was that spot selected? Oh, um, Sierra Pacific actually approached uh, California Fish and Wildlife and the Fish and Wildlife Service and said we have land that we think would be good for fishers here. And I think they also did it in preparation for the potential listing of the species because they were able to develop a, CCC, a CCCA, um, which uh, sort of gives them a little bit of leeway with timber harvest in areas where fishers occur um, and because they have fishers on other parts of their landscape as well. So they really were the ones who kind of spearheaded it. They thought that they had um, quality habitat for fishers. So, yeah. Does the porcupine population possibly recover? Would you ever want to look at if there's any overlap in prey selection and changes to get the kind back? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there we have some evidence that there's porcupine out here, um, like, but very, very few. Yeah. Um, but if they did come back, it would be really interesting to see what, how that, those scat analyses would change. Do they immediately switch to porcupine or are they just continually kind of taking opportunistically uh, the squirrels? I think that would be super interesting. Hopefully they do come back. Yeah. Um, my understanding was that fishers ate a fair amount of fruit and fine dye. But, um, so those are kind of hard to identify in scat because they're, they're not left like bone and hair. But yeah, they absolutely do. Yeah, I hadn't heard you mention that. Yeah, um, and that was actually something I thought was interesting when I was learning about squirrels and how much fungi they eat, and then sometimes fishers are eating fungi as well. It's kind of an interesting overlap there. But it's harder to um, detect those things in scat surveys. There's, there's likely a lot of that going on, and then right, you can see really it in fresh really scat. Going through their use of absolutely. I yeah, I, compl I absolutely think that could be the case. Yeah. I think there's a lot of food for them in those stands. Yeah. I'm curious about your uh, uh, stand selection. Um, you mentioned relatively large trees. Can you give us a range of DBAs in that canopy closure? Yeah. Um, I just was, you know, trying to not be too specific, but I the average was 20, uh, uh, 28 inches or 28 centimeters, excuse me. <laughs> and then the canopy closure was at least 60%. So those were minimums. So it had to have an average of that. It was a quadratic mean diameter um, for, for the trees and it was uh, an average for the, the stand. 
Um, so about, and those stands were three hectares in size. Yes. Um, well, fishers are actually, um, they're kind of an individualized in their behaviors as far as time of day. We found um, that they tend to actually be more crepuscular than the previously thought. Um, but as far as hunting strategies, um, some work that Roger Powell has done tracking fishers in snow, he's found that depending on the animal that they're following, they'll make either direct paths to them or more of a, a slinking kind of hunting path. And often when I would find fishers resting on a tree branch, um, I would actually find them in a dray, which is a squirrel nest, uh, like an old squirrel nest. So I think that sometimes they might actually find the squirrel in the nest and kill them there. And then they would eat the squirrel while they were resting, um, which is really cool. I've actually seen several s fishers come down from a branch with a squirrel in their mouth. So I think either they're catching them on the ground and taking them up there, or they're actually finding them in those drays and on, in, in the trees. I think both are probably occurring, but Roger Powell has found that they they do um, do like a, a more of a beeline hunt to something like a porcupine and more of an ambling kind of moving through the landscape with smaller prey items. Are they actually able to hook into the tree and climb up the tree? Yeah, they sure are, and they actually have a really cool joint in their hind feet, so they can turn their feet backwards. So when they're climbing down a tree, it's like behind them, if that makes yeah, sense. They're similar to a squirrel. Mm -hmm. to yeah, if you ever want to have a fun night, Google like Fisher catching squirrel, and there's really cool YouTube videos <laughs> of them there. running up and yeah, down okay. trees. Awesome. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Nice. And it, it also looks like, I know it's 88 degrees, but it seems like that tongue would be really good for like getting ants and bugs. Oh, and yeah. Like and you know, it, it, you might be able to see he has some peanut butter on his nose. A lot of the photos that I get, they have their, uh, the animals would have their tongue out, just like a dog when you give it peanut butter. I think that's part of it, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sticky. Oh, yeah, all the way in the back there. Um, I don't know the percentage. I just know that they they utilize it throughout the year. It's something that they're they're taking throughout the year versus other squirrel species that will mostly only um, collect them for the overwintering for in the spring and fall. Sometimes I've seen like piles of acorns and Douglas squirrel middens before, um, but I don't know the actual breakdown of that diet. Yeah. Sure. If there was, did I see a difference in the seasons? I don't have the figure here, but um, we didn't. We, it it varied throughout the year, but there wasn't any one season where we saw higher detection versus uh, another. It was um, generally varied a little bit, but there wasn't like in the winter time we saw a lot more. We thought that maybe when the leaves fell on oak trees, that maybe detection would increase in those oak stands and black oak stands, but we didn't see that happen at all. Awesome. But I did only do my survey for one year. So if we were to survey again for additional year, we might be picking up on some of those seasonal patterns that I could have missed. So definitely possible. Yeah. Usually the peanut butter went first, yeah. That would be the first to go. And then, you know, if, if a bear didn't come and eat them right away, because that was pretty common too, sometimes 12 hours later it was gone. Um, but usually the peanut butter would be gone for the first visit. Whatever animal got there first would eat all the peanut butter. And then the walnuts, since they were in the shell, that actually helped increase our ability to get pictures because the animal would have to kind of finagle with the shell a little bit and break it open. So those were usually there a little bit longer. But again, peanut butter, free peanut butter, you can't say no. Yeah. Um, I got a lot of wild turkeys, which I thought, <laughs> which was really weird. Um, that would probably that was probably my biggest surprise, actually. Wild turkeys. <laughs> they were just like hanging out around there. Yeah, yeah. Um, in the wild, 
the I think on average they don't live super long. Males again die sooner. I think it's like around four to six is on average. But we did have um, a couple females on our population that were we had an eight year old and a ten year old female. Um, she sadly passed away that year. So that was the oldest fisher I knew. Yeah. Good question, Julie. Um, do you have any um, insights or knowledge about uh, fishers' interaction with sudden oak death um, and also the invasion of fox squirrels and their replacement? Uh, yeah. Dis displacement of gray squirrels? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Sudden oak death is so far hasn't been a huge problem this far north. It's definitely becoming more of an issue. And um, I think that would be another thing I could add to that slide along with drought and fire that managers should consider how sudden oak death might affect tan oak. I think it would have similar consequences, right? Um, as far as fox squirrels are concerned, I'm not sure what kind of habitats they're really displacing gray squirrels in. I don't know if it's, if it's at elevations and forests quite like this, but I would think that a yeah, exactly. More like oak woodlands. But I would think that a fisher wouldn't care if you're a fox squirrel or a gray squirrel. You know, you're still tasty. Yeah, a little, a little yeah, yeah, exactly. But still bigger than a Douglas squirrel. So. Have you been able to visit the one in the Archaeus community forest? Oh, there's one in the. No, I haven't seen that one. Okay. The one? Do you think there's only one? I haven't. <laughs> but the I one. I think we have. I was going to mention. I mean, there, there are fisher in Arcata. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think there may be more than one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jacoby Creek Forest, we've seen them uh, on camera there as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great question. I actually um, wanted, these are such great questions, I, I wanted to just muse for a minute, if I may, Please. about these cameras and these photos and how useful these data are and how you can get more information than you think. So, 100,000 photos, which then she and her collaborators agreed to share with another student at Humboldt State who completed her undergraduate honors thesis on looking at the relationship between fishers and gray foxes and whether fishers are displacing gray foxes in their behavior in areas where fishers occur since they were just reintroduced and in areas which they don't occur. And so I really kind of wanted to explain how great it is to be able to contribute to one project and potentially support right now two, but maybe three or four. And I wanted to follow up with uh, one of our other grant recipients who, again, I say you guys, as a community funded John Johnston to do camera work in Ecuador. I need to send you, we just got our first paper published um, with thanks to the Sequoia Park Zoo um, for a ex range expansion for, this is one species, but range expansion for two species based on a camera study done in a kind of a part of the world that had not been detected before. So um, it's really exciting that work that this community can support can have um, bigger repercussions. So thanks again. And with that, I just want to, there was a lot of great questions. I wanted to thank Andrew yeah, thank for your time and let whoever might need to go release them from here. But if you have additional questions, I'm sure she'll have a few minutes to answer. So Absolutely. thank you very much. Thank you.